Hello, my name is Susan Murphy. I um, I have been asked to come and speak by Dr. Ho about um, how epilepsy has affected our life, and I said to her, are you sure? <laughs> because my son has um, quite a catastrophic epilepsy, he has Lennox-Gastro syndrome, and um, our family experience has, has really not been the typical family experience, but thank heavens we have Rita coming to follow me. <laughs> so it, it, uh, it will end on a, um, on, I think on a more typical course than, than what our family has uh, experienced. It's uh, a bit easier to speak about my family if uh, I show you pictures um, so you can relate to who I'm talking about. This is my husband, Noel, and my daughter, Colleen, uh, a couple of years ago at her high school graduation. And, um, and my parents, uh, commonly known as Oma and Opa, and my son, Kevin. And um, Kevin was fine, healthy, uh, developmentally normal child until about a month before his fourth birthday. And then he had a seizure. And then he had another seizure about 10 days later, and we were referred to uh, Dr. Farrell at BC Children's. And we were put on, he was put on some medication, and we were hoping that all would be good. But within the next six months, he started having hundreds of seizures a day. Uh, he was having difficulty walking, and uh, he couldn't speak properly anymore. So he was admitted to hospital for about three months, and... Um, during that time, he had lots of tests, and they were afraid that he had some kind of condition, uh, a degenerative condition, that would because he got sick so quickly. So it was a very, very scary time for us. But after three months of, um, of lots of tests, they decided that he just had a difficult to manage epilepsy. They started calling it um, astatic myoclonic epilepsy, and then after a few years, that was changed to Lennox-Gastaut syndrome. So over the next 16 years, he. Uh, Oops. Wait a sec, I'm trying to put this here. Why why I won't click through Elvira? <laughs> Just go to next maybe? Aha. Uh -huh. He tried a few medications okay. to control his seizures. Uh, none of them were really all that successful at controlling his seizures, but at changing his behavior. Um, uh, a lot of medications ended up causing him great side effects without much benefit. And he had a few other, um, how come I keep getting this? He had a few other treatments as well on top of the medication. He's been on several special diets. Uh, he had a corpus callosotomy to try and decrease his seizures. And uh, he's had three vagal nerve stimulators. He was the first child in Canada with a vagal nerve stimulator. And he's also fairly recently tried the Atkins diet. He spent lots of time in hospital, uh, about 1,450 days in total. Um, so all of this definitely had a, an effect on our family dynamics. In the early days, um, in the first year or so, I guess the, the, the thing that was um, the most prevalent was turmoil and chaos because we had a fairly normal, happy life. Um, Kevin was going to preschool, I was working part-time, my husband was working, and suddenly uh, you land in hospital and you can't work and you're busy trying to sort out um, your child's condition. And it takes a long time to accept your child's condition. Uh, the first time he had a seizure, I kept saying, well, just because he had an episode doesn't mean he had a seizure. And then after a while, I thought, okay, well, just because he had a seizure doesn't mean he has epilepsy. All those words have such meaning attached to them. And after a number of years, um, you know, just because he has epilepsy doesn't mean he has Lennox-Gasto syndrome. But after a period of time, you accept all that. The turmoil starts to diminish a little bit as you, as you settle into a new routine. But the fear, the fear of the future and the fear of what's going to happen to your child, I think, doesn't really ever go away. But you do adjust to a new reality, take on new roles. Um, I became, how we split it in our family, and after listening to Dr. Ho, probably not the healthiest way, is my husband said right from the beginning, you're the nurse, you deal with the medical aspects of his care. I'll deal with Colleen. And so we kind of went split our family. I was always at the hospital with Kevin. 
Noel was always at home looking after Colleen, and my parents were always there from, for Colleen as well. Um, and, whoops, I'm having trouble with the clicker here. After a while, it kind of uh, went on and on, and this is his thousandth day in hospital, and it becomes kind of a chronic stress. And, and some of the effects on our family dynamics, I suppose, is this little time to foster relationships. The focus is almost completely on your child's medical needs. Um, at first, you have friends that are more than willing to help, but then they tend to fall away after a while, just because they don't know, they don't know how to help you anymore. And, and you don't have the energy. Friendship is a two-way street, I think, and it also takes energy to maintain your friendships. And unfortunately, I didn't, I didn't have that kind of energy available. So we lost a lot of friends. And a lot of, actually, a lot of my closer relationships came with um, people in the hospital, uh, some of the caregivers that we were spending more time with than, than sometimes with my own family. And um, unfortunately, really unfortunately, I was not able to spend as much time with Colleen as, um, as I would have loved to spend. And looking back on it, what makes me, one of the saddest things of this, of this whole experience is I don't remember a lot of her childhood. I don't have a lot of memories of my daughter's childhood, which is very sad to me. I'm hoping that she's never going to ask me to write down my story or our story because, um, because I don't have a lot of recollection. Um, Another, another big issue for family dynamics and functioning within the family is dealing with the side effects of Kevin's medications. Oftentimes he was um, aggressive and uh, his behavior was horrid. And the, the, the stress of that and the stress of that in the entire family, especially Colleen, you know, when he's having a five hour temper tantrum over a toy that she has and you're trying to parent properly and not give in, but at the end everybody's screaming at everybody and you're all screaming at Colleen, just give him the toy, you know, and she had to live within that, within that um, atmosphere and, and not always, but it was definitely hard on her. Also, your life becomes an open book, especially when you're spending that much time in hospital. Most people can close the door and parent their children in relative privacy. But when you're always in hospital or you're always, you know, fighting for um, what you need at school or what you need out in the community, there's so many people that you have to involve and there's so many people that are always right in your life so that you don't have that privacy. There were times, especially when we spent a few months in hospital, that the thing I craved most was just a, a, just a little privacy, just close the door and let me parent my child. And another stressor on the family is, of course, the financial stress because, because Kevin was spending so much time in hospital and I was staying with him in hospital, I ended up giving up my permanent part-time position and going to casual nursing and we lost our benefits and um, I, my income went way down and my husband self-employed, sometimes works and sometimes doesn't. So a lot of things that other families get to do, like going on vacation and a lot of extras, um, is something that we we had to forego, not only financially, but it's really hard to take a child that has seizures every day on vacation. So I think how it affected Colleen, um, she missed her mom. I tried to be there for as much as she could. The hospital was great, child life was wonderful. She spent weekends at the hospital with me. She got to do all kinds of special things, but it's not the same as you know, having your mom at home every day like, like a, a little girl should. She was two years old when, when Kevin got sick. Um, she had to put up with Kevin's behavior, and sometimes that wasn't easy for her. He would be physically um, aggressive and uh, just emotionally difficult. Uh, she was embarrassed to have her friends over to visit, so she would spend, a, um, as she got older, a lot of time away from, from home. When you ask her, how did this affect your family? Her first answer is always, we didn't get to go on vacation. So that was a big thing for her um, compared to all her friends. On the other hand, she grew up very sensitive to other people's needs. She's, uh, a lot of people say, mature beyond her, for her years. And I think that's um, a lot to do with her brother. When she was growing up in the younger years at school, she was Kevin's uh, best advocate at school. She was always checking on him at lunch hour and recess and, and um, 
the teachers were always very impressed. When she got to high school, she wanted nothing to do with her brother. And she did have a few rebellious years where she didn't maybe make the best choices um, in friends. And uh, I think she was punishing her parents by not doing her schoolwork. I kept telling her she's only punishing herself, but she thought she was punishing us and making not great decisions. And I know part of that is just adolescence, but I think she had added reason to be, um, to be a bit rebellious. And has this changed our relationship? Um, I don't think you can go through something like this and not have your relationship changed. We're still together, married 27 years. But all these years, we lived very separate lives. I did Kevin things, and I did um, one way of myself coping was to, to be very involved in volunteer work and giving back. I felt I needed to give back because I've got so much support and so much um, care here that I, I did a lot of volunteer work at the hospital and keeping busy and taking care of everybody else. That was how I coped. Not so great at looking after myself, but very good at looking after everybody else. I think my husband coped more by trying to keep his life as normal as possible. And, you know, sometimes that causes a bit of um, friction. But, but we've settled into our routine now. My, uh, Kevin has been in hospital for three years. But we've lived separate lives for so long that we've settled into our separate lives. And we're, we're great partners in that we get everything done that needs to be done. But as far as our personal relationship goes, um, I think that's really suffered. There's not a lot of closeness between us, unfortunately. And what does the future hold for Kevin? That's um, the scary part. He's remained developmentally where he was when he became ill sort of around four or five. He knows his letters and the sounds they make. He's never been able to learn to read. Um, he likes everything five-year-olds like, Dora the Explorer and Sesame Street. And so he's completely dependent on us for his care. Um, and the future is a scary place. We're hoping to keep him at home for as long as possible, but um, realize that we won't live forever and we need to look at um, different living situations for him eventually. But it's, it's kind of a scary place to go. And we know, unfortunately, some kids that have had not so great experience with group homes. And, and so we're, we're, we're just starting to explore other living situations for him now. But um, we're, we're happy to keep him as home as long as possible. And then again, you have all your relatives and friends giving you the best of advice. Like, isn't it time you put him in a group home? <laughs> No, um, no, we're happy to keep him at home for now. But it's, it's sad and it's scary when I think about what will happen to him when I'm not here. And it's sad to think of the pressure that Colleen must be feeling. We, I've never said to her, you have to look after your brother, but I know she feels that pressure. And, um, and uh, she has often told me that she wishes she had a few more siblings to help with her brother. And how I cope with this is I surround myself by really, people will ask me, how, how have you dealt with all of this? And I, I haven't dealt with all of this by myself. I, I tend to surround myself by really supportive people. We're a very small family. It's just the four of us plus my parents. I'm an only child. My husband's an only child. And his um, parents are in Ireland, but he doesn't maintain a relationship with them. So a big part of my emotional support has been my parents. They've been there for me, for us emotionally. They've been there for us physically when we need, obviously, a lot of care with Colleen when I'm, when I'm not there and Noel's working. Um, they've been there for us financially when, when the car breaks down and there's no money to fix it. They've been there in any way you can possibly imagine. They've been pillars of support for me. And, and I think the hardest part for me this year is that my mom passed away. So a big part of my support is gone, and I'm still trying to deal with that. But um, it's, uh, it's hard to replace that kind of support. And the other people that have been very, very supportive is the people we've spent 1,450 days with over the last 15 years. The nurses and the physicians in the hospital, I can't imagine they have become our second family. I can't imagine having to do any of this without without help on their on journey, and that's Dr. Conley with Kevin. We've met so many amazing physicians, Dr. Conley, Dr. Farrell, Dr. Selby, Dr. Zaid, uh, that, uh, that without their help on this journey, I don't, think, I don't think we would have made it, any of us. And then finally, to sort of sum it all up, um, there's a story which some of you might be familiar with called Welcome to Holland. And whenever people say to me, you know, what's it like? How can you do this? I love to read this story because it kind of summarizes 
the experience. It was written by Emily Pearl Kingsley, um, and she was the parent of a child with Down syndrome. So our stories are different. Her child was um, six since birth, and, and mine not until I was four, but the, but the experience, I think, is fairly similar. So I'll just end by, by reading Welcome to Holland. I'm often asked to describe the experience of raising a child with a disability, to try and help people who have not shared that unique experience to understand it, to imagine how it would feel. It's like this. When you're going to have a baby, it's like planning a fabulous vacation trip to Italy. You buy a bunch of guidebooks and make your wonderful plans. The Colosseum, the Michelangelo David, the gondolas in Venice, you may learn some handy phrases in Italian, and it's all very exciting. After months of eager anticipation, the day finally arrives. You pack your bags, and off you go. Several hours later, the plane land, and the flight attendant comes and says, Welcome to Holland. Holland, you say? What do you mean, Holland? I signed up for Italy. I'm supposed to be in Italy. All my life, I dreamed of going to Italy. But there's been a change in the flight plan. They've landed in Holland, and there you must stay. The important thing is that they haven't taken you to a horrible, disgusting, filthy place full of famine and disease. It's just a different place. So you must go out and buy new guidebooks. And you must learn a whole new language. And you'll meet a whole new group of people you never would have met. It's just a different place. It's slower paced than Italy, less flashy than Italy, but after you've been there for a while and you catch your breath, you look around and you begin to notice that Holland has windmills, Holland has tulips, Holland even has Rembrandts. But everyone you know is busy coming and going from Italy and they're all bragging about what a wonderful time they had there. And for the rest of your life, you'll say, yes, that's where I was supposed to go. That's what I had planned. And the pain of that will never, ever, ever go away because the loss of that dream is a very significant loss. But if you spend your life mourning the fact that you didn't get to Italy, you may never be free to enjoy the very special and very lovely things about Holland. And that's it. And Holland is pretty lovely. We're pretty content being there most of the time. I actually had tea with the people that lived in that windmill about three weeks ago. I was just in Holland. So it's not a horrible place. But I still, I still mourn Italy all the time. And every time there's a milestone that Kevin can't meet, it's like not being able to go to Italy. But most of the time, you can't live in, you can't live in that morning Italy stage all the time and, and we're we're fairly content now in Holland. Thank you. Thank you very much Susan for a very touching experience and sharing that with us. Thank you. And now we have Rita, child life specialist of our hospital also parents of a child, and she would like to share the experience with us. Thank you, Rita. Hello, everyone. <laughs> um, as Audrey said, I am a parent of a, a 10-year-old who has a diagnosis of a very benign form of epilepsy, and she lives with her two parents. Um, I'm also a child life specialist at BC Children's, and most people have no idea what that is. So I'll just briefly tell you a little bit about what my role is in the hospital, because it does relate to the experience that I had um, as a parent. So um, my role as a child life specialist is basically to provide positive and normal experiences for children in hospital. Uh, so lots of play, and also to help them cope with, and their parents and siblings as well, to help the family cope with the reactions that they're having to hospitalization and their illness. So my daughter was about six years old when she first started showing some symptoms. And they were symptoms of daily dizziness, um, sharp abdominal pains, nausea, splashes of color in her vision as she described it, um, and even short moments of loss of vision. Um, basic exams and blood tests always came back normal. It didn't look like there was anything medically really going on. That was hard to pinpoint. Um, and at the time, her symptoms were just attributed to maybe migraines related to some stressful experiences that we were going through. 
Um, we had some grieving in our family that we were going through. Um, she was also being bullied in school. Um, there were some learning issues. Learning was difficult for her, but we weren't really sure what that looked like. And we were moving, so there was a family move. Uh, the symptoms did worsen, and her dizziness was so bad that she couldn't even walk at times. And the visual changes grew stronger as well. So eventually we had a, a CT, MRI, and some EEGs done, and it was there that she was diagnosed with a benign form of epilepsy. So she was about age seven at this point. So we started some medication, and a lot of her symptoms actually worsened, so we weaned the medication. And a few months later, that was when Natalie had her first witness seizure. I don't know if she had any before, I questioned it, but that was a definitely um, definite seizure. So we tried different medication um, and things approved over the next few years and, and now she has very few symptoms um, medically and we've weaned her off of her medication so um, that is a lot more reassuring to us. So we just continue to, to deal with some of the learning disabilities and some attention issues. So what I kind of learned about that experience was um, there was, was a lot of fear. I knew something wasn't right initially. And before the diagnosis, because of where I worked and the different kinds of things that I had seen in families, and I, I had worked on the neurological unit for a couple of years, I was filling in all the blanks with things that could be going on. Um, I, I, all the worst case scenarios were going through my head, uh, brain tumors or something neurological that was degenerative, so I was really scared. I thought about the parents who I've worked with um, who were waiting for had just received a diagnosis and I knew that look, that sort of that blank look of shock on their face and I knew theoretically that there were normal reactions to that experience of getting a diagnosis but when it happened for me it was way more intense than I thought and, uh, and I was dealing with something quite benign, pretty minor so I thought I shouldn't be re reacting that strongly um, there were other fears that I had. Um, once at school, my daughter fell off the playground and she broke her arm. And when my husband called to tell me the school had let us know that, my first thought was, did she have a seizure? I was scared that something was happening again. Even at home when she was playing in her room, all the little bumps that I could hear upstairs from her room uh, and noises made me want to go up and check on her. And I, I think when you're stressed, you, you kind of make up things that might, you know, what if and what could be happening. It's, it's hard to remember all those things that you try and keep in mind all the time. You try and hear objectively when you're at appointments. You try and sleep well, um, respond calmly to, to your child. And the reactions were really varied, I found, in our family and in different times that we were going through things. There was also some loss of control that we felt. Um, as you know, there's lots of unpredictability with epilepsy. And so you don't know when symptoms will occur and what treatments are best until you try them, what the triggers are, how things will progress. So it's hard to have control in that area. And you wonder how can you keep your child safe when you're not there? What if, what if she has another seizure? Um, you wonder if your child will have a seizure while they're alone in the shower, so you don't allow them to be independent and have showers alone. Um, who do you trust to look after your child? You wonder if you should tell other parents for play dates or sleepovers, um, parents who might be watching your child, all the details, or will that make them isolate your child and treat them differently? For my husband, he was concerned about the stigma that was attached to our child's condition. That would make people treat her in a less positive way. Um, a lot of people are quite naive around seizures and neurological symptoms, and they don't really know what to do, and so they're sometimes afraid. I questioned if I was overreacting to symptoms, because overall, she was still living a pretty normal life. Um, there was just some days where she couldn't walk, or she'd be doubled over in pain, even if she was doing something she really enjoyed. But overall, she was doing okay, and, and so it was, there was a lot of unknown to deal with. And I found that getting some control back in the areas of my daily life that I could control helped. So whether it was spending time with the family's members that I wanted to spend time with or that I hadn't for a while, getting laundry done, 
um, paying bills, whatever was important to me at the time, if I could just get some of that in order, some of it would feel more stable. Um, I had some interesting reactions when I became involved with the healthcare team. Um, and I thought, even though I had skills working within the hospital system and I knew a lot of the staff who were working with my daughter, I still felt intimidated. It was such a new experience. I was, I was worried that maybe I wasn't reporting things accurately. What if I missed something? Maybe their treatment plan would be different if I said something different. I felt appreciative of the family-centered care that listened to me as a parent. And at the same time, I felt I had too much responsibility on me to influence the diagnosis and the treatment. It was an emotional load that I didn't really anticipate. I found it helpful to get informed, to learn as much as I could about um, my daughter's diagnosis, to find out what resources were available to me, so a library in the hospital or a specific person that I could call if questions came up. I found it helpful to keep a really accurate and thorough history because my, when I'm stressed, my brain doesn't remember things very well. And if something came up again, then I could refer back to it. Oh, at that appointment is when we were told this, for example. Um, asking questions is really helpful. And I find from a parent point of view and a professional point of view that it's okay to speak up and ask questions, even if people seem busy. And in fact, healthcare professionals really find it helpful to know what your questions and concerns are. Uh, but that takes time, and um, it might take you out of your comfort zone, but it's important to do. And so you have to kind of find out what you need to cope, and that can be a challenge in itself, because maybe you haven't really thought about that too much until you get challenged. Um, for some people, it was exercise or finding someone to talk to, time to reflect, um, journaling and meditation. Those were things that helped me. Um, other family members I had to recognize might not be coping the same way as me and so might not be able to support me. But I also found that my parents, Oma and Opa and our family as well, were very, very supportive. A skill that I found especially helpful for coping was learning how to advocate um, for myself, for my daughter, my family. Um, at the hospital, if there were multiple teams involved, I had to speak up. Um, so for example, when she broke her arm, I had to say, well, she's on this anti-seizure medication, it's due at this time, and she can't have the Tylenol for pain because it interacts with it. And, and pe there wasn't always the communication between the different teams. In school, um, especially like in our case, there are some problems with learning and attention. So um, pushing to find out what was going on and how can we get an assessment um, communicating with all the teachers, talking about things that were going on medically. It was a little bit tricky to navigate that one when I didn't really know how. But overall, it, it does help get your um, child the service that they need. So we did get an assessment and people became aware of what to do if there was a seizure and how to supervise her. In, in your family, um, I think that sometimes you have to advocate for yourself. I, in my work, I often hear family members talk about getting unwelcome advice or families who just don't get it or the information is too much for them to cope with emotionally. Um, so educating people it takes effort, setting boundaries, um, finding a person who can be a spokesperson. If you have to deal with a hospitalization, one other person can call everybody that needs to be called and recognizing the intentions behind some of the funny things you might hear. In, in my family, it's a very um, small family. We have an extended family that includes my parents and my brother and his family who live in Regina. So my parents were the only ones really around. And actually now it's just my mom. Um, <clears throat> in, in our family, my brother had epilepsy his whole childhood. So my mom was already aware of what epilepsy was. and what tests and treatments might be. And in fact, it was her, it was my mom who was present with my daughter when the seizure happened. So she knew what to do and was able to report what had happened quite accurately. And I was so grateful for that. Um, my mother was a support to me because she understood what I was going through and related similarities with her own experience. Even though it was 45 years later, we had a lot of similarities. And she was somebody that I could trust to look after my daughter. 
And that was huge for me. I was a bit paranoid when everything began. My brother was also supportive when I needed to talk. And I was actually just thinking about being a sibling at the time, and I remember thinking how unfair it was that he got to take all those pretty colored pills every day. And so one day I went and opened up the jar when no one was looking and tried a Dilant, and I was like, ooh, that didn't taste good. I tried a phenobarbital, that didn't taste good. Now I'm realizing, what did I do? <laughs> but it wasn't fair. I was thinking he got all this extra treatment and gifts at the hospital that I didn't get. Um, my husband and I dealt with things differently, but it was compatible. I was happy to be the main one going to appointments and keeping track as I knew the system and, and I need details to cope. And my husband was like, give me the bottom line and I'll be fine. And so it, it seemed to work for us. Um, what kind of did change was who's going to take the time off work this time if there were appointments or my daughter wasn't feeling well. And that was a, a challenge for us. Um, so my role as a mom really expanded through all of that experience. And then there were the practical things. So the supervising of your child, that people watching your child will need to know what to look for and how to help your child and what medication to give. I mean, I remember the first overnight camp that I was terrified to let my daughter go with the rest of her class to an overnight camp because what if? And will she have her medication and will they know how to give it? And um, so I wrote up this long list and the nurse called and thanked me for the very detailed notes that I sent along. Um, and so that communication was important and helped reassure me, but I think that you have to kind of find the balance between micromanaging, micromanaging to ease your own fears and keeping your child safe. And what went well, um, I so clearly still remember getting the diagnosis um, that my daughter had this epilepsy. Um, it was worded so clearly and positively, and I think that really set the stage for a lot of our experience. Um, the words I remember hearing are definitive results, can be treated with medication, don't worry, it's not dangerous, can live a normal life, and then there was a follow-up appointment planned. So those were all very reassuring things for me. Um, I think that you know, we are very grateful for the care that my daughter had at the hospital and that made things easier to cope with as well. And we know that things will be okay for her in the end, um, that she eventually will outgrow her epilepsy. It's just the learning kind of stuff that we're challenged with now. Um, but I remember just to, to close, one family who I learned so much about and they said, focus on what is positive. It is so easy to be pulled into um, all the negative things and wallowing in it and really focusing on it, but you have to consciously choose to um, decide how you can make that day the best for your family despite the challenges. And some days that's really difficult, and, um, but I think it's, it's worthwhile if you can try and focus that conscious effort that way. Thank you very much.